They don't say Betamax, do they? <laughs> All right. Uh, hello, everybody out there, and welcome to uh, this Hack Surfer Hangout, talking about critical infrastructure. Uh, we've got two guests with us today. The first is Adam Meyer. He's the chief security strategist at Surfwatch Labs. And we got Harry Sverdlov, the CTO of Bit9 Plus Carbon Black. Um, if you guys want, you can ask any questions during this Hangout. If you're watching on Google, there's a Q&A app. You can type the questions right in, or you can tweet them to at Hacksurfer right there, and I'll check Twitter before we uh, end this and make sure to ask any questions there. Um, so yeah, welcome, guys. I guess to get started, um, maybe we can start with you, Adam. Just maybe say a little bit about yourself and how your company is related to sort of critical infrastructure. Yeah, sure. So Adam, I'm the chief security strategist for Surfwatch Labs, which is our you know local cyber risk intelligence company. Uh, prior to that, I was the CISO for one of the largest transportation organizations in the country, uh, and before that, I was director of information assurance for the Naval Air Warfare Center. And uh, for, from a critical infrastructure perspective, we don't have uh, deal directly with products from critical infrastructure, but we provide cyber risk intelligence for everybody, right? And critical infrastructure is obviously going to be a consumer of that risk intelligence, just like any other sector uh, for the most part. Um, so, so we play into every space. Yeah, and Harry, can you say a little? Sure, absolutely. And thanks for having me, Jeff. It's Harry Sverdlov. I'm the Chief Technology Officer for Bit9 Plus Carbon Black. Um, I'd go through my kind of resume, but it would take up probably three hours <laughs> of dating myself here. But prior to uh, joining Bit9 Carbon Black, I was a principal architect at McAfee through an acquisition of a company called Site Advisor. So I've been dealing with security from both a traditional aspect as well as more advanced aspects. And we certainly live in a day and age where traditional antivirus just isn't effective anymore. Um, and Bit9 is focused on providing advanced protection and not just prevention, but detection and response technology. Um, for your endpoints, for your servers, systems, and certainly for critical infrastructure. So we do a, a lot of our clientele um, is involved in critical infrastructure, um, oil and gas, and utilities as well, because um, these systems, many cases, they're outdated systems. Um, they're certainly not uh, effective at protecting them with traditional antivirus, um, and they need a new approach to not just prevent some of the advanced attacks or the targeted attacks we see, but also to be able to do continuous monitoring, um, detection, and response um, for you know what nowadays we've you know pretty much become commonplace, which is the inevitability of compromise. Um, yeah, I, I guess critical infrastructure, just to get started, is kind of a sort of a big category. You know, when I talk to people, there's you know, some people talk about telecom, energy, utilities. Some people even throw like banking in there. Um, so, just kind of wonder if I could get your guys' thoughts on you know when you think critical infrastructure and cybercrime. I mean, what is I guess what pops into your mind as you know an area of concern, um, kind of out of that whole broad spectrum. Well, Adam, if you want to start. Yeah, sure. So, so you know, my my my. My brain always defaults kind of to, to the, what I call the blue collar environment when you think about critical infrastructure. You're obviously looking at uh, oil, gas, uh, water, transportation, aviation, healthcare, telecom. Those are all technically uh, critical for infrastructure sectors. Some are more mature than others. Obviously, the financial and banking industries, as you know, officially part of critical infrastructure, are way you know obviously more mature than others in, in different sectors. So I typically default to the ones that are behind the curve, if you will, when I'm talking critical infrastructure, talking your transportations, your electric, your your services, right, your utilities, if you will, um, or transit and transportation surface or, or aviation uh, that moves goods and services around uh, quite a bit. So I generally dive towards that area uh, primarily. Sure. Um. For me, basically, with critical infrastructure, one of the ways, and it's a little limiting, but one of the ways to think about critical infrastructure are these are the these are the systems that if they stopped working, people would die. Now it's a little bit oversimplistic, or perhaps uh, a bit overdramatic, um, but they're basically the things that we depend on. Whether it's for clean water, um, for energy, um, they're the types of infrastructure. For example, when there's natural disasters, that FEMA will come in and they will oversee, and/or um, they're often very highly regulated industries because commerce, livelihood, uh, energy, food, water—they all depend on critical infrastructure. So in many cases, they're the uh, parts to our society that essentially we take for granted. You don't talk about them a lot, you don't see them a lot, but they're running everything in the background. Yeah, and what's interesting, when I always read articles about critical infrastructure, you know, cyber warfare and cyber war and terrorism and those kind of, you know, hot 
hot button issues always kind of seem tied to critical infrastructure. Um, so I'm wondering, you know, if you guys think that's an accurate portrayal, you know, of the problem, um, you know, kind of always being so closely tied to cyber warfare, or if you think it's, you know, like hyper, maybe the media plays. I don't know here if you. Sure. Well, <coughs> with critical, I'm sorry. Yeah, with critical infrastructure, you're, you're dealing with you know, certainly two possible adversaries. One, of course, we think of it in cyber warfare, and this is just a natural extension of living in a digital age, where, uh, and if you're going to attack, and we've seen this. Um, in, in certainly in Russia, we've seen this in other international conflicts where when there is uh, political conflict, one of the targets is in fact the infrastructure and there's many ways you can do infrastructure whether it's leveling of bombs and or of taking out uh, their cyber infrastructure. But we also, one of the other aspects with uh, critical infrastructure that I think we're starting to see more of and it's a dangerous trend um, is that of the hacktivists or that of the unpredictable side. Um, where as a matter of protest, um, not necessarily for uh, uh, political uh, or nation-state conflicts, but simply somebody with an axe to grind. It could even just be a disgruntled employee, if you will, somebody less predictable, um, being able to cause significant damage. Um, because again, this, it, it, everything is just interconnected, and in many cases, these are obsolete systems. So I don't think critical infrastructure is just um, the purview of nation states. There's certainly also the infrastructure. They're they're a potential target for hacktivists, for disgruntled employees, for insiders. They t tend to be less of a target for criminal enterprises. That at, at least the infrastructure side, because there's not a lot of profit to be made. But certainly from the financial side, if if we include things like financial services. Uh, uh, you know, uh, stock market banking, then of course if that's included in critical infrastructure then it's absolutely uh, the purview of criminal, en criminal enterprises. Yeah, just, just to kind of uh, what one additional point uh, to, to kind of uh, go along with what Harry was talking about is I also think, you know, when we think about critical infrastructure from, from a nation state versus other threats out there, I think uh, we really got to look at what's the commodity uh, and that's going to define what the adversary is. So, you know, the commodity from a critical infrastructure standpoint, your traditional services or your public services, right, your water, your gas, or your fuel, your energy, those types of things, would likely be more of a, a nation-state target, but in a covert type of manner, meaning they're likely infiltrating, they're likely getting various command and control type of capability, and they're going to sit back and wait and use it if they choose to use it. The more overt cyber crime is hitting the the, the banking, the, the the financial industries, because obviously the commodity is is theft, right? So they're looking for it's more overt. You see it more in the news because the consumers impacted more so. But you know, I think uh, that gives us a sense of complacency because we don't see it in the news very often. But if you think about it, if you lost your your electric uh, to everything you have right now a lot of things shut down very, very fast, and a lot of things go bad really, really fast. So I think we have a, a complacency problem when we're thinking about nation-state versus um, uh, more the hacktivists or the, 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 the theft uh, type type of actors. Uh, but we, we, you know, the movies can, or easily can, can, can um, uh, heighten that awareness and use that for their for sensationalism. Uh, but when you really, really think about it, you know, everything we're using right now on this Hangout is depending on power. And if we lost power, commerce start, stops, healthcare stops, transportation stops, logistics, supply chain, all of that starts coming to a halt with one critical infrastructure sector, and, and it be, it's a very big problem. Uh, yeah, I see we have a few uh, questions out there from people that are watching. Um, from Ryan Murphy, he's wondering if there will be an, ar an archived version of today's session available. Um, and yes, there will be. It will be one on our, our YouTube channel. I'll share that uh, once this uh, chat gets over with in about an hour. Um, then we got a question out there from Matt, kind of tying into this subject. Uh, he says, uh, there was a story about a nuclear power plant in South Korea, um, Korean Hydro. Um, and the hacker was able to bypass the company security. I think they stole uh, like blueprints and maybe some personal information. Um, he says, luckily, not much came from it. But how worried should should we be about future attacks like this against you know nuclear um, infrastructure? 
Right. Well, we've actually seen, you know, we've, we've certainly seen cyber attacks do damage to critical infrastructure. We saw this with Stuxnet several years back where um, the Iranian nuclear facilities um, were targeted by a, a highly sophisticated targeted attack that caused kinetic damage, that caused damage to the centrifuges uh, that process uh, uh, fissive material. And it actually caused damage to the reactor said to set back their nuclear program anywhere from five to ten years. I think... You know, it's not a matter of causing panic, but you know, and I've I've spoken about this before. The challenge with critical infrastructure, um, you know, not not to say a platitude, but it's a not it's not a matter of if it is a matter of when. When we look at how many things are interconnected, when we look at the fact that most critical infrastructure, um, these are computers operating physical machinery, physical pumps, physical things that are in many cases are. Uh, well, very expensive and they're decades old and so you often have equipment in remote locations you have computer equipment that's high that's extremely outdated um, and so we know that our critical infrastructure is vulnerable to attack we know they're often not using the latest uh, advancements in security so the only question is if it is vulnerable and we know this and it can be breached um, why hasn't it happened already and to date the, the major answer has been because there hasn't been motive most nation states don't have, unless they're going to war, don't have a large interest in attacking someone else's critical infrastructure. Um, you know, Adam, you had mentioned the, the scenario, or I think it was the question, the scenario of the South Korean nuclear power plant, which that was the case of cyber espionage. And so there you had motive. If someone has motive to, a tar to target, but not necessarily, there was no loss of life or no damage, but there was motive. That's why I, you know, I mentioned when we talk about hacktivists or insiders or disgruntled employees, all it takes is one person or one rogue nation to have a motive. Um, and we already know they have the capability. And when that happens, um, then we're going to start seeing more. Uh, it, it is inevitable that we will see damage from an attack on critical infrastructure. It was estimated, I think, last year that 70% of our nation's critical infrastructure had been compromised at some point. Um, in 2014. So again, it's not a matter of if, it is a matter of when, and, and more importantly, it's a matter of depending on who's doing that attack, what kind of damage, what would the after effects be? Would we lose power on the eastern seaboard, or would there just be a brownout or nobody would notice? So just to throw in a couple other points as I was sitting here listening to Harry, a couple of, couple of ideas came to mind too is, you know, coming from the critical infrastructure sector myself, there's a lot of other things that or aren't purely technology driven that plays a card into a lot of why they're behind. I always kind of, and this is, there's exceptions to rule. Obviously, a lot of energy um, from the blue collar side is, is more advanced than others. Aviation's uh, getting getting more advanced. And, and when you look at these things, a lot, there's a lot of uh, moving parts to this ecosystem when you think about it. It's not pure technology. To Harry's point, a lot of stuff is old. It's it's very dated. It was built for re resiliency. It was built for reliability. It wasn't built to be secure. And 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 uh, so a lot of it's you know decades old, uh, quite certainly. And that takes funding to, to move that aircraft carrier, if you will. That takes a lot to, to turn the aircraft carriers. A lot of funding issues. Believe it or not, it's a blue collar workforce. The reality is you have a lot of union uh, challenges uh, when you're changing how you do things. If you're looking to upgrade and change architecture, not only do you have a lot of labor costs, you have a lot of material costs, you have to make sure that the services are still being provided to the public uh, depending on the sector they're in. You're changing a lot of things. And, and, and I think a, a lot of those play behind the scenes from the pure cybersecurity threat, obviously. We have to keep costs in control uh, a lot of times. And, and you know, how would you like your energy bill to go up or your oil and gas bill to go up in your household to pay for cybersecurity? And, when you get into realities of these things, you think no consumer wants to see their bills go up, right? So I think that's where you see a lot of those challenges, especially with the executive order for critical infrastructure and the NIST cybersecurity framework, why there's a lot of talk about incentives, how can we get incentives out there. Um, you know, I don't think they're going to move a whole lot until they start offering grant money or things to, to actually fund a cybersecurity program. You know, but that's why you see a lot of this push and pull. Why are nothing change? Why is nothing changing? You keep hearing talk, 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 but nothing's really moving. And I think it, you know, it's a lot of this behind the scenes type of issues that, unless you've worked in that environment, you may not see it a whole lot. And and it takes a lot of um, relationship building and a lot of moving parts to to kind of get going quite a bit. And the new technology needs to gel with the old technology. Uh, there, nothing, nothing's a light switch. Nothing flips a switch. You're talking 
millions upon million dollars of, of infrastructure investment and you're going to have a, a what I would call a legacy system with a new deployment working side by side in parallel and you have to keep those services up and running a lot of times. So that's a little bit of the what I feel is like behind the scenes type of issues that keep things dragging on. Uh, yeah, and kind of playing off that, we have a question from Monica. Um, just wants to know, you know, obviously people are always talking about the critical infrastructure in, in the United States is, you know, deteriorating and, you know, needs to be upgraded. Um, and, you know, at the same time, cybercrime is, is definitely rising. Um, so kind of going off that, I'm curious, um, you know, there's just so many, uh, you know, for example, looking at, like, the water systems. I think there's, like, 150,000 water systems in the United States. So we always see all these articles about how easy it is for you know hackers to to get into these water systems, um, but I'm wondering if you can maybe put that in perspective, or because you know I guess my impression is that it's a lot of the the, the small ones, you know, because I think like a hundred thousands of those are, are you know very small, or you know things like campgrounds and things like that, um, as opposed to you know like New York City. Um, so my impression is that a lot of like the 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 ones like, say, New York City are, are fairly well protected and it's all the little ones that are maybe more vulnerable. Um, I don't know if that's accurate, if you guys would agree with that. Let's, I'll certainly let Adam Adam comment this, on this as well. You know, one of the challenges with critical infrastructure is there is a lot of um, mergers, acquisitions, and motion in this. So even the larger entities, um, any any number of them, any large uh, energy company um, or or water processing plant, that you often see a lot of where they've acquired and or brought into the fold smaller regional utilities, regional critical infrastructure, and so they're still they're they're larger, but there's just a hodgepodge of a lot of different infrastructures and a lot of different technologies. So the challenge actually isn't easier. The challenge is in many cases harder. Uh, it, it's it, in in a, in a sort of backward way. It's almost easier to secure uh, a, a simpler regional more monolithic infrastructure than it is in some of the large complex ones. I do know certainly, you know, as I mentioned, a lot of our clientele um, are in the critical infrastructure space, that there are certainly um, uh, companies that are on the cutting edge that are investing heavily into uh, raising the security bar into making it more hard, uh, making it harder, making it more difficult to uh, have a catastrophic uh, um, cyber attack. Um, but I don't know that I would... Uh, I don't know that I'd necessarily say that larger necessarily means safer, unfortunately. Um, and Adam was talking about some of the complexities of and the costs involved in moving it, uh, uh, in improving that. Unfortunately, one of the ones, and we see this <coughs> in the commercial sector as well, um, security is generally thought of as a tax. It's not a profit. It's it's a cost, whether you look at it as a tax or an insurance policy, and often the biggest motivator, unfortunately, is an incident. Um, and when we're dealing with an critical infrastructure, unfortunately, the incidents can be um, much more visible or certainly can have much larger kinetic or physical impact. Yeah, and I think also what plays into this is, is who has command and control over those entities as well. So when you look across uh, different instances of, of and we'll just, we'll just call it water, we keep using water as an example, depending on your locale, it could be a not local nonprofit, it could be a local for-profit, it could be a cooperative, it could be a, an agency of a state or local government. Uh, it, there's so many different entities out there and they're all going to have their different, what I would call chains of command, if you will, and those chains of commands are going to have different influencers on what they view as a, as a problem, right? To Harry's point, a lot too many organizations see it as a cost and not a capability, if you will. And, and they're not going to address anything until they really, really have to address it. Uh, 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 the culture in what I would call the blue-collar world is, hey, if it's not fit, broken, we're not going to go out and fix it, right? Because that takes labor, it takes resources. There's a lot of other things that are broken we need to fix before we pay attention to something that's not fit or not broken. And, and I think that's a, a general culture problem. I saw it every day for, for years when I worked in that environment. When I sat around uh, the last... Uh, event I did with Homeland Security before I left my previous role was a round table with every single sector we did a tabletop exercise and I could see that culture and every single answer walking around the table on any given scenario and and I see progress as well I see a lot of the association stepping up and trying to be a broker of information uh, you know working with government working with their industry working with the regulators because another problem is to be 100% honest and frank is, you know, a lot of the uh, critical infrastructure sectors don't want to deal with the government because they don't want to be regulated any more than they already are, 
right? So they they're very very tight about I don't want to I don't even want to ask you for help because I'm opening the door for Big Brother to come through and hammer me some more for not doing something right. And and that's the reality. And I think that plays a huge role more than technology. I think the, a lot of the senior leaders certainly know what's going on. I, I see lots of communications from the associations coming out um, saying, hey, what's the best practice? This is the right thing to do. You can see them uh, playing some feedback loop there, some communication with government. But when it when push comes to shove, you know, it goes back to, I don't want Big Brother regulating me anymore. And so I think that's why when you see in the news, especially with the president's recent uh, another executive order regarding information sharing and government needs to work with uh, the, the different critical infrastructure sectors even more. So you still kind of, jury is still out, right? I kind of, I see, you know, I don't want to uh, speculate much farther than I already have, but you know, we'll, you know, we'll see how it goes. But that's the reality of why things are slow. Right. To yeah, be honest. Unfortunately, it's you know, Adam's right that in many cases, certainly in the case of critical infrastructure, regulation, it's not security net per se, or um, compliance is not security, but it is sometimes the necessary stick to kind of push the ball forward. Um, but Jeff, to your question about is the smaller uh, less secure, say, than the larger, I think the other aspect to take into account is the risk environment and the threat landscape. And quite frankly, again, it goes back to your adversary. If you're dealing with a disgruntled worker or an insider, anybody, we're all equally at risk. An employee of a small power plant or a small water processing facility could be just as disgruntled as somebody who works for a large entity, but from the other types of actors, cyber espionage, nation states, um, generally speaking, the larger companies have a higher uh, surface area. They have, they're a more appealing target. If I am uh, looking for, uh, if it's cyber espionage and I'm looking for the plans to a better filtration process, I'm likely to go after the larger, more successful ones. If I'm a nation state and I'm looking to get a foothold to at some point in the future maybe cause damage, I'm going to cause more damage going after New York City than I am going after, you know, some place in the middle of, well, I won't say any place, but in the middle of nowhere, so to speak. <laughs> Yeah, where I live. <laughs> right. <laughs> Some place where it's snowing, like here. Um, yeah, I guess you had spoken a little bit, Harry, about um, the sort of the the reason that a lot of these maybe physical damage is kept in check is because because the motivation is not there. Um, and that's something I know in 2013, Keith Alexander he said that to Congress as well. Um, basically said, you know, if people wanted to do damage, you know, they could, but, you know, there's no motivation there. But then he also kind of gave a little bit of a warning that, you know, some of these other actors might not necessarily be held in check that way. And then, you know, over the past 18 months, since then, I've seen a lot of discussion about, you know, how more nation states and more groups are sort of getting involved in sort of the espionage and critical infrastructure. Um, so I'm wondering if you guys think there's maybe... Um, increased worry that we're going to have some actors or some groups that maybe don't have that same, that same uh, uh, whatever you want to call it, you know, thing holding them back from from doing some of these rules of engagement, yeah. <laughs> or deterrence. I, yeah, I would, I would actually say when I think about that, when you look at the the activity of like the cyber cellophane right now, you know, they're they're looking for news items and they want to demonstrate that they can reach out and touch you. Um, you know, great. You know, to Harry's point, yeah, I think obviously the large metropolitan areas that that have a, a, a target uh, on on their back all the time, uh, you know, or obviously would be high value targets and things that would obviously make the hit headlines around the world. But on the same note, I think they're the influence of what the overseas actors that aren't necessarily nation state; they're more of a um, activism type of stuff, religious activism, if you will. Um, are, are going to be looking for any target. You know, they're going to be looking for any news item, and they're, you know, if they can get access and they can, you like, you know, get in a position where they can act on their motivations, even if it is the small water company out in out in uh, out in Midwest, if you will, or something like that. They may not have the huge populations, but they reached out and they did it, and they did it from the sandbox overseas, and they're able to possibly able to do it again. And so I think that would. Um, be the likely uh, occurrence that would happen versus a, a major um, uh, event, which may be more nation-state driven if that ever happened. Yeah. Here's the thing that concerns me the most about sort of, is, is it more likely, is the, the, is 
are there do we have to worry about other nations or more actors if we were talking about physical war if we were talking about kinetic warfare it's there's an expensive barrier to entry you have to have a draft you have to recruit people you have to go out and buy materials you have to manufacture tanks guns whatever it is you have to do it's expensive it's costly it takes time but if you want to enter the cyber war game if you will you need two guys in a Google search engine and that's the barrier to entry to this war that we're dealing with um, and you know in fact in security it's often a, a, an interesting debate we have because we in security when we see different threats when we see um, interesting types of attacks what do we do we publicize them we talk about them as we should but now in many cases well for example with Stuxnet when Stuxnet was first discovered if you will um, and we in the research community took Stuxnet dissected it were fascinated by its capabilities and we posted snippets of its source code and within six months there were four copycat variants out there that used some of the same techniques so now you have a situation because if you will the commoditization of malware the the um, E the commercialization so that I can buy and sell on the black market if you will on the dark webs um, I can get zero days I can buy sample malware I can test my my techniques the barrier to entry is very small so I'm a small nation I either have an axe to grind or I want to make a statement in the world I just need to hire a couple smart guys or gals do a little Google searching and all of a sudden I have the capability to do something damaging um, and one of the things that we've seen um, that's sort of a frightening trend is as you, you we've seen this just recently with even though it wasn't critical infrastructure was with the attack the recent attack on Sony Pictures uh, to Sony Picture Entertainment this was not critical infrastructure um, unless we consider Hollywood to be critical infrastructure which some might um, but what you saw is the capabilities of a few even if whether it be sponsored by a nation state or not able to actually cause instill fear to cause damage possibly to do significant financial disruption um, but also just really s to do whatever their their purposes is whether it's to stop uh, a movie from being released or just to instill uh, a sense of fear into their targets um, and the barrier to entry is not that great the same happens and the same principles apply in critical infrastructure. Yeah, I wanted to get you guys' thoughts on Sony. Uh, Matt actually has a question in here. Mm -hmm. um, basically, you know, when the attack happened, um, a lot of people were talking about how the attack was cyber warfare. You know, it's not really necessarily related to critical infrastructure, but I thought it was interesting that we see all these attacks, you know, all the time, you know, some, you know, very damaging. And then with the Sony one, it seemed to get elevated to, to cyber war, you know, so quickly. Um, uh, just wondering if you guys have any thoughts Kind of on that. Well, I, I, I definitely would not, personally, I don't classify really anything as cyber war. Um, to me, it was it's still very strictly a, a law enforcement issue. It is a theft issue. It is a um, uh, potentially a um, terrorism issue, depending on the definition you use, uh, where it's in, to instill fear. And obviously, there was some some threats made during that course where they said, hey, if you show the movie, then we're going to attack the movie theater physically, right? So there's there's some threats made that started drifting into the terrorism type of realm definition-wise. I don't see it as a war. Uh, war, to me, is, is flat out uh, destroy one another by two or more nation states. There's kinetic and non-kinetic issues going on there um, to achieve a, a, a political or governmental gain, right? And, and so... Uh, people, to me personally, use the term war way too loosely in this cyber realm. Um, this is still, to me, very much a law enforcement, anti-terrorism, anti-theft, cyber crime, whatever you want to uh, uh, term you want to throw in there. Issue first and foremost because they're they're having an economic impact. They're having a um, uh, intellectual property theft uh, impact. There's a anti-terrorism impact. But I don't view it as war. I view it as we are certainly losing the war against the crime, um, you know, almost like a war on drugs kind of kind of concept. We're not doing the right things. Uh, boards are not overseeing their cybersecurity posture appropriately. They're not seeing it as a business resilience issue, um, which they need to do obviously now, and and they need to up their game quite a bit. There's a whole lot that private companies need to do to protect their consumer base or customers or suppliers or finances or infrastructure, the regulatory environment they got to live within. There's a lot of things they need to do 
um, to do that. I don't see it as warfare personally. So it's yeah. I don't. I in, in this particular case, I agree with Adam here. I wouldn't classify this as cyber warfare, but warfare does have a ha, you know have appropriate application when you're dealing with a long-term set of objectives um, and you're acting against those objectives. And we have seen cyber intermixed with international conflict when Russia invaded Georgia and others and and other international conflicts we've seen where cyber is one of the components one of the tools used where they'll do denial of service attacks against uh, um, corporate or federal uh, sites and services as well as putting boots on the ground um, and that we certainly are seeing more examples I wouldn't call it pure cyber warfare but where cyber is a um, integral part of a long-term campaign Again, whether or not we use the word war or we just say international conflict. In the case of Sony Pictures Entertainment, I don't, I wouldn't call that warfare, but I would, I do think um, calling it terrorism or cyber terrorism, even though it certainly has inflammatory connotations, I think that's accurate. If uh, a group of individuals were to have held a theater hostage at gunpoint and said, don't show this movie or we're going to blow up the theater, we would all agree, hey, that's terrorism. Well, this is the virtual equivalent. They steal all of Sony's you know, emails, intellectual property, private uh, communique, and say, don't release the movie, or we're going to release this information. It is not warfare in the traditional sense. It's, it's certainly asymmetric warfare, and it's more akin to terrorism. It just happens to be happening on the cyber realm, and therefore we call that cyber terrorism. So there's lots of different types of um, uh, attacks that we're seeing out there and cyber is no longer just something in and of itself um, just like we, we see this in cyber crime it's often commun it's mixed with people physically stealing credit cards or physically going to ATMs and withdrawing money based on stolen credit card numbers done through cyber so cyber is just another component to be a terrorism espionage warfare criminal activity uh, and in the case of Sony, yeah, I would not. I would agree. I don't. I wouldn't call that warfare. But I do see a disturbing trend, which is terrorism or terrorist type tactics. They get emboldened by each other. Uh, and a, a good example in the crime, cyber crime area, is that of of malware like CryptoLocker. So there's this is ransomware, where a piece of malware goes onto your machine and it encrypts all your data, locks your computer, and force and says, "We're not going to give you your computer back until you pay a fee." Now. Ransomware has been around for almost 20 years. It's an old concept, um, but yet it seems to be making a resurgence. Now, why is it making a resurgence? It's making a resurgence because it started becoming successful again, and it was getting highly publicized, and so uh, other criminals said, hey, wow, look at all the money, all this stuff being happening with CryptoLocker. We want to get in on this action. Where there's money, you know, there's, there's going to be criminals. Um, and when I see situations like what happened with Sony, um, it is concerning because then you know that there's someone else with, um, and there's other tin pot dictators or other folks out there that ha are saying, hey, look at the success of this type of campaign. We want to get in on that kind of action if we have an axe to grind as well. Yeah, we've talked a lot about, you know, <clears throat> sort of like destructive attacks and warfare and stuff. Um, I'm just curious to get your guys' thoughts. Um, obviously, you know, I'm really not involved in the critical infrastructure sector. Um, just in terms of kind of other threats that are out there. I mean, when I think of critical infrastructure, I always think of, you know, like I said, espionage or, or cyber war, you know, bringing down the electric grid, stuff like that. Um, but obviously it's a pretty complex ecosystem, so I was just wondering if you could maybe talk about if there's any other things that, that come to mind, sort of away from sort of the physical destructive side, or if that maybe that is all there is. I mean, well, I think I think the physical destruction is what gets the, gets the news, but, it, right. you know, it's critical infrastructure organizations have, to me, the same threat landscape as any other organization. They have employees who click on the wrong things. They have consumer information that could be uh, theft for an identity theft uh, a la Anthem. You know, they, they obviously have customers, and they keep their customer information into a repository, and that just shows, you know, depending on their customer base, that's just as much risk as anybody else from a identity theft potential. They have financial transactions. Uh, obviously, they, they a lot of current infrastructure collect and you know uh, uh, payments, bill payments, all these types of things. Uh, they have HR data. They just have that extra, that that extra risk of what I would call vital systems. So uh, from current infrastructure past term, I use is vital, non-vital. Anything vital typically has a life safety tie to it. 
Um, and so you get into, again, is, is the uh, water system sanitary? Is it potable water to drink? Is it safe to drink? Your healthcare community, can I, um, I need the certain devices, medical devices and medical infrastructure to, to, for life safety. Uh, for energy, it's what's my critical infrastructure to deliver critical power to critical cu customers, those types of things, um, and that's what I term as vital. So I think they have all the same risks that, that we have right now in our organizations with the addition of vital infrastructure that has a life safety aspect to it. That's a very general example, um, but I think uh, I, I can't really think any other differentiator um, uh, for that, the defense industrial base has something similar for the military side and intelligence community. Obviously, they they have something there that that an adversary greatly desires for whatever reason. Um, uh, but I think they have extra influence uh, or extra risk landscape, if you will, uh, because of that vital environment. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think there's there's no question as any company, private or public, has potential. If you have private information, if you have uh, do financial transactions, you you have HR data. You're you're absolutely a target for cyber criminals um, who might want financial gain. Infrastructure happens to have that extra titillating factor. Um, really made popular. I, don't, I think at the beginning, Adam, you were talking about made popular by Hollywood. I don't know how many times I could count that after somebody saw Die Hard. I think it was Die Hard with a Vengeance when they talk about a fire sale. There's that one guy who, like, apparently there's one master password that you could take out everything. All water, all power, all phone, all roads, everything. And everybody always asks me, is that possible? And I always say, oh, absolutely, sure. And then I go off in the back room and do that. No, but seriously, they're, they're not that way, but they have that aspect to them that gives them that extra makes them extra appealing for the cyber terrorist. So I think of that type of profile, um, somebody who wants to instill a sense of fear or just panic, um, they make ripe targets for that group, even if this, the attacks aren't that successful. Um, imagine if power just blipped out for 30 seconds, but it was due to a cyber attack, the types of headlines that that would make. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, I wanted to kind of get your guys' thoughts on all the sort of government involvement in cybersecurity recently. I know Adam kind of touched on it a little bit, but I thought it was interesting. I was reading uh, an article, and, you know, Obama was saying, you know, it has to be a shared mission and talking about how the private and public sector have to sort of work together. And then they had a, a, a quote from John McCain where he says, uh, I've been to more meetings on cyber than any other issue in my time in Congress with less accomplished than any other. So it seems like everyone's always talking about getting more, more sharing and doing all these things, but then, I mean, obviously, you know, you got senators and people in the private sector kind of a lot of times making fun of it or saying, you know, nothing's getting done. So um, just wondering if you guys maybe want to talk about that and then, like, what what needs to be done or, I mean, if you want to try to play politician well, for a minute. <laughs> well, I think I, I got a, a handful of observations. One is is cyber always brings out the privacy hawks, right? So there's a, there's a very strong privacy lobby out there um, that that, you know, obviously doesn't want privacy protections to be diminished, right? And so I think there's a lot of complexity there, especially when you look at United States privacy law um, are all dictated by the states. So you're going to have uh, 50 different attorney generals having an opinion depending on um, what the topic is from a privacy standpoint. Then you've got some international privacy issues that come in with like um, safe harbor, a lot of European Union type of privacy things. I think that just brings complexities that people probably don't see. Again, it's one of those one of those issues you may read in the news. It just says privacy issues, but there's a lot of devil in the details behind that. I think that that stalls a lot of things. Um, the the other part is is obviously um, it's very hard to very difficult to legislate a private organization to do anything that their board of directors doesn't want them to do. Um, you know that's the bottom line to my earlier point. You know, a lot of organizations are still calling cybersecurity a cost uh, cost center, right? It's a cost. It's not a capability. And so they, they recognize the risk or maybe he read about the risk a little bit and say, oh, well, you know, we have different risk mitigations in place. You know, if, if, I, if I look at the, the actual operations of, of what we're doing and I only see $10 million of liability there and I'm insured to a certain extent for that, and I've got some due diligence in place, not necessarily a perfect uh, uh, cybersecurity program, but I'm exercising some level of due diligence. I don't really want to get in there. 
So I think that's why the government has a hard time. You can't really force anybody to do these things, and and that's where legislation starts to stall, I think, because private sector is going to want incentives. Government's going to be really constricted on what those incentives can be, and then you end up kind of having a stalemate. It's, it's, I, I see the recent stuff as the same deja vu as we've been seeing the past five years. People want to share more information. Usually they have a classification problem on top of that. Things are overclassified. They have a hard time stripping out um, things that... Um, uh, SAMI, which is sources and methods intelligence, right? They don't want to obviously give up too much information of how they know that information in the first place to share with private industry. Um, and so that, that's kind of the third point. Overclassification is a challenge because that is a regulatory issue and, and a law, legal issue. Uh, privacy protections, which is also a legal and a regulatory issue. And the third part's incentives. You know, you just can't force an, a private organization in the United States to do anything they don't want to do. Uh, it, may, it may be bad business in the long run. Uh, they may want to think of that from their business plan standpoint, but you can't really force them to do um, anything that's not already within their current regulatory environment. That's kind of where I'm at. So I, I'll kind of give, I, I land on both sides of the coin on this, so I'll give an optimistic and a pessimistic and hopefully wrap up with a little <laughs> bit of optimism in terms of my view. You know, Adam had said that it, the conversations going on now are sort of the same, and they are, that we've been hearing in the last five years. That said, go back ten years and you didn't hear this conversation. And at the speed of government, by the way, five years is not very long. Um, and why do I bring that up? I bring that up because the fact that they're talking about it, now we can. I'm, I'm not a big fan of government solving problems. I don't think they do that very efficiently. But the truth is, five, more than five years ago, they weren't talking about it. It wasn't recognized. Um, it wasn't something that uh, people were concerned about. And now it's not only on the front page of the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal, be it critical infrastructure or incidents, you know, high-profile ones, as like with Sony or Target or others. But it's being talked about in D.C. It's being talked about at the legislative level, at the executive branch level, and that's a good thing in it in its in concept at least because it means that the awareness is raising it means that it's also happening in the coolers it's happening with moms and dads at a dinner table and people need to realize that there's a problem it, with if that discussion doesn't happen and it's left solely to just technologists and security technicians and backrooms we've known about these problems for 20 years and we've been shouting at you know our lungs for 20 years at security conferences oh this is huge problem and nobody was listening now, when, when, when the State of the Union, when Obama speaks about it or the legislators who speaks about it, people at least start to listen. And I think from an awareness perspective, that's a good thing. So that's an optimist. On the pessimism side, I actually, you know, I agree with Adam that centralized solutions don't tend to be very effective. Um, and one of the challenges, you have the privacy issue and you have the one-size-fits-all fits challenge. Um, we, we use the word critical infrastructure sort of like the way people nowadays use the word cloud to mean everything. Well, everything's, you know, there are very different ways you would secure a nuclear power plant than the way you're going to secure a water filtration system. The equipment involved is different. The security involved is different. The technology involved is different. And then if you want to talk about banking institutions or other things that might be critical infrastructure or transportation, they're very different. There's no one-size-fits-all solution. There's no, okay, if everybody does X and the government's going to legislate that and put a penalty on it or a carrot and a stick approach, um, it doesn't work very well. Um, that said, so that's the pessimism side. I don't think, you know, I certainly share skepticism that the government will be the source of the problem, uh, source of the solution, I should say. Now, I'll wrap up with a little optimism, though. We have started to see, and I'm not, it's in part, it's because um, I think there's been, at a federal level, heightened awareness and a, and a bit of a push, but also in part because there's just a growing sense that, hey, we do need to work better together, because the truth is that if you're, you work at a water filtration plant or an energy plant, you have an expertise, but it's generally not in cybersecurity. Um, your expertise is whatever it is that your company does. And they've realized, well, we've, we've got to start sharing our information. We've got to start saying, hey, what are you seeing out there? Um, start pooling, if you will, leveraging our cyber expertise so that we can all get better. 
because the bad guys aren't stopping. They're learning from each other and they're swapping secrets and, and or selling secrets to each other. We've got to do better. And so we have the formation of private communities, of information sharing communities that have come about. Um, we have the formation, NIST, which it doesn't have teeth to it now, but when NIST came out with the cybersecurity framework, it's a very good framework. It's an excellent framework for how to measure and monitor a cybersecurity or an information security um, uh, program. And they're not being pushed down companies' throats just yet, but the federal government is talking about it. And in many cases, that itself is a good incentive because Adam's right. Companies don't like to be told what to do. So when you start hearing inclinations, oh, there's going to be a new cybersecurity bill passed, there's going to be new regulation passed, in many cases, companies try to get ahead of that and say, okay, well, what can we do on our own to improve it? And also, we're doing this not just because we care about cybersecurity, but really because we don't want the government telling us what to do. Um, and so when I look at those kinds of things, even though it's kind of a strange motivation, I actually am optimistic that cybersecurity, the awareness is going up, private corporations and critical infrastructure companies are starting are starting to collaborate better, um, have recognized the problem and are making steps to improve that. And in part, in part, it's because the government has started to promote cybersecurity at a higher level, at an executive level. Um, yeah, well now that you said that, you know, basically there is no one size fits all solution, maybe you could give us one because we had a question here, best, what are the best practices for protecting critical infrastructure? Um, so I don't know maybe if there's anything in your mind that sticks out, maybe the companies aren't doing well or maybe if you want to look at a specific case or anything that kind of comes to mind. Well, yeah, I mean, I think uh, there's a couple things they need to do. Uh, the first the first issue is is all critical infrastructure organizations manage risk at some level. They all have some level of risk management program in place, uh, especially since almost all the critical infrastructure has some type of safety component to, to what they do. The overseers, the C-suite, the executives in those organizations really need to place cyber within their risk management program, the enterprise risk management program, because there's so many dependencies on cyber now that did not even exist 10, 15, 20 years ago. There are new risk items and they need, really need to manage things at the enterprise level along with their other risks that they, that they measure. Uh, secondly, they, they need to establish their cybersecurity program formally and, and, and measure that risk, uh, measure the execution of that program and do what I call the bread and butter things. The, the, the top 20 critical controls, uh, to start off with is what I would do if you have nothing and, and a lot of these organizations from what I heard reading between the lines they don't have a whole lot going on they have one or two IT guys or gals doing basic things somewhere in the IT department buried uh, within the organization so there's not anything robust by any means start with the top 20 critical controls type of uh, environment do those well before you go on to other things once you're doing those top 20 controls well, go on to the cybersecurity framework, the NIST cybersecurity framework, because there is so other um, uh, aspects of that uh, framework that, to Harry's point, it's a good framework. It's a, it's a great roadmap. If you don't know what to do, lay that thing out on the table and figure out a plan of what you need to do. What people, process, technology do you need to get all of those areas in the framework up to some level of capability? You don't have to boil the ocean all at once, but you need to pick the pick the most um, uh, least mature and you know uh, aspects of that framework and bring them up at least one notch right You're, it's for progress and and the last thing they need to do is they need to make sure that they're looking at things from a resilience standpoint too many times it's looked at as a as a pure IT department issue a pure technology issue and it, it really needs to be a business resilience stuff it's it's how do we weather the storm if an event happens it's do we have the right resources in place? Do we have uh, a lot of times emergency management plays a, plays a factor into these types of things. I, I worked in transportation. We had a, a large emergency management issue within the cyber realm. Uh, so if you're if you're a, a critical infrastructure that's part of healthcare, obviously emergency management plays into that. Disaster, uh, acts of terrorism, anything like that, you're you're going to have to be resilient. Telecom the same way. You're going to have critical communications coming across critical circuits. Please fire local responders when you're talking about the infrastructure at the state and local level needs to be in play. All these types of things really need to think of it as a business resilience issue and not just a technology problem that you 
throw only tools at. Obviously, tools play their part, but you have to throw everything else at it as well. Tools are just an, something in your toolbox, right, to go along with people, process, and, and, and budget, to be honest. So those are the types of things that all critical infrastructure needs to do. So I, I definitely, I'm going to... I, I agree with Adam across the board. I'll, I'll add a couple extra points. Um, there's no question that, in, and the interesting thing about resiliency is most critical infrastructure already understands the concept because they've been they've incorporated resiliency into the electrical grid, into the water filtration, into the physical things that they're doing. What happens when one power grid goes down, um, or one uh, one generator? Uh, um, how does the the uh, system rebalance itself. The same approach needs to be applied to cyber and what happens when a system is compromised. Can you operate? How efficiently can you operate when you're operating not at full capacity? Um, I also will second the the importance of a framework um, and it really is important. Most people don't have a framework and here's the problem. You're never ever going to come across a security department that says yes we've done everything we need to do and we've had all the money we needed to do it. It'll never happen. And you'll never be able to do everything there is to do. So you need two things. One, you need to be able to prioritize. How do you need to identify based on risk, based on impact, where are you going to put your resources, your people, process, technology, a framework. And there's a number of them. The NIST is, is just a, a good example. A framework helps you do that prioritization. So you can say, OK, my most important assets are here and here. I'm going to focus here first. The second is you need to be able to measure. So it's, you know, you can't just deploy, we all want security to be sort of this set and forget mentality, but that's not the way it works. Um, and so being able to establish the controls and the procedures so that it's continuously measured. And it, what do you measure against? You measure against your framework. How are you doing? What is your coverage? What is your ability to uh, protect against certain things to recover? Um, and one of the nice things about the NIST, the NIST framework prescribes, first step, it's identify, protect, detect, respond, recover. It's a series of five stages. You have to identify where your assets are. You have to protect them. You have to detect when something goes wrong um, in those controls, in your protections. You have to be able to respond, and you have to have a practice and policies in place, and you have to be able to recover. But the last point I'm, I'll make just to uh, add to what Adam had said is specifically, well, it applies, I think, certainly in financial, but it all certainly applies to the critical infrastructure. So I'm going to get on a quick soapbox for a second um, about our whole cyber or uh, internetization of everything. And we also see this in the quote unquote Internet of Things, where we're taking everything and interconnecting it. Um, and what's happening is we're actually taking, whether it's a pump, it's a filtration, it's a sensor, and we're putting, because we're putting computers into them, full fledged operating systems. Because we take an embedded Linux operating system, we put it on there, but we're just using it to f maybe to give us sensor data, or we're just using it to control the speed of a pump, or whatever the, the, the uh, manufacturing equipment might be, but it's a full fledged computer. And so it has all the same capabilities and therefore all the same vulnerabilities. And one of the challenges is in securing our critical infrastructure is we're not recognizing that for all intents and purposes, most of the infrastructure, the cyber infrastructure in critical infrastructure are fixed purpose or fixed function systems. So that it's similar to financial because it's similar to ATMs. And so there are security controls. Granted, yes, I'm biased. I, yeah, I'm the CTO of Bit9 and Carbon Black. And one of the things we do is help ensure that a system only does what it's authorized to do, but the idea, the concept, which is what to me is, is, is the most important, is that if you have a system and its purpose is X, but it's capable of doing Y and Z as well, Y. In, put in the controls in place from a technology people end process. So put in the controls in place so that it's only doing what it's supposed to do and nothing else. Put in the, the process and the people in place to figure out when it's doing something it's not supposed to do and it's not so easy to do with your laptop or your desktop at work because you're always doing something different. In critical infrastructure, this problem is actually highly tractable. Uh, and we need to apply certain principles, um, a different mindset of principles to security in critical infrastructure that than we are currently doing. We currently have a mindset of, okay, let's just look for bad and, and, and when we see bad, let's stop it out. Um, and that mindset just doesn't doesn't scale and it doesn't work, especially when you have an environment where you already know what's supposed to be good. So I'll get off my soapbox now, but that would be, I think, from a technology perspective, one of the most, if not the most important thing we can do um, in securing critical infrastructure. Uh, yeah, we have a qu another question here from uh, Derek. 
Uh, he wants to know who are the main players in the critical infrastructure realm? What organizations can the average security professional get involved with? Well, from a high level, I mean, Homeland Security has oversight over, you know, quote, critical infrastructure, unquote. And they have everything broken up into subsectors. And every one of those subsectors has an organization tied to it that herds the cats, if you will, as best you can. Um, so you can navigate the Homeland Security's website. All of these are published. It's not, I don't you know, know the specific ones right off the top of my head. Um, so if you're looking to just see what the official definition of the different critical infrastructure sectors are and which critical infrastructure oversight uh, agency, uh, you know, obviously I was in transportation, so uh, Transportation Security Administration was ours. Uh, energy would obviously be overseeing energy, a lot of different, you know, it's, it's kind of broken up that way. Uh, you can see who, who the go-to office is, if you will, and a lot of times they'll have resources available on their website, things like that. You can also see a lot of non-for-profit groups are involved. There's always an association of some sort that helps be the lobbyist or advocate for those sectors quite a bit. There's almost always an association. I haven't come across a, a sector that didn't have one, two, three, or four or more different associations being advocates for those organizations. So I would start there and then you'd probably find some type of a breadcrumb on uh, something specifically to what you're looking for. Yeah, Adam's absolutely right. Within every one of the uh, different verticals, there are information sharing communities or ISACs. Um, and, you know, financial services is the FSI SAC, retail is RS, I think it's RI SAC. Um, in the energy sector, I believe there's, a, I don't remember the acronym offhand, but there is an ISAC as well for information security sharing, um, which is a group that formally and informally get together and meet and share information. Certainly from the federal side, in addition to Department of Homeland Security um, and in many cases your local FBI, there is ICS CERT, which handles incident response for the industrial control segment. Um, and one of the things that's actually, speaking federal for a second, that I found that definitely has changed in the last five years is they've become more responsive and less accusatory. So it used to be, and it still is in some cases, you're always afraid to call the feds because they're going to come in and they're going to tear everything down or say, everybody stop, and it's going to become this nightmare, and they've become much more collaborative um, in working with the private sector in either sharing information when possible um, and or just helping in response, an in incident response. Um, and so I certainly would encourage, if you're in a critical infrastructure, to reach out to your local FBI office. You already know who your peers are in the industry, so reach out to them as well. Almost every conference now, I, I speak at the API, uh, the, the uh, Petroleum Institute conference down in Texas, they get together and cyber is, a, is, is the focus in many cases, or if not the only focus, one of the focuses, talk with your peers. Um, because there's, if there's a conference going on that's for your vertical, guaranteed cyber is going to be a topic of conversation. Guaranteed you're going to be meeting up with your peers in security. And in some cases, um, you're going to have uh, a great source of, base, of networking and saying, hey, what organizations are you a part of? Um, I see it in there it's the uh, I ISAC, I ISA ISAC, ISA ISAC. I don't know if that's the uh, right acronym, but it's definitely one of the ISACs. Yeah, and, and one of the challenges with ISEC though is it's you know you can share for a fee. Um, it, you know there is a cost with a lot of the ISACs uh, depending on the ISAC, yeah. um, and so that's why I usually push people to government first because you might get started for free, you might get involved in some nonprofits to at least get an understanding of the ecosystem. Um, and and I see Derek also is asking uh, you know no industry orgs that are making major inroads. I don't see. To be honest, I don't see one, and, and on you know, Harry, jump in if you have. I don't see any specific industry organization really at the at the pedestal jumping in, making waves. Energy's doing good. FSI SAC is always in play. Um, retail, not too much. Healthcare actually just popped up. The uh, healthcare ISAC just popped up. Lockheed, yeah, uh, is is seeing the to really be up in their game quite a bit. So I think there's a lot of maturity. Right increasing across, but I don't know, Harry, do you have anybody that jumps out? Well, the F of all of the ones I've dealt with, the FSI SAC is the most mature um, and certainly the most advanced in terms of coordination and information sharing. There are there are organizations like InfraGuard um, and ISSA that are uh, that are locally based or regionally based, I should say, also national, but they have regional chapters that are great. I will tell you that the best information sharing I've seen 
it didn't happen because it came mandated or dictated from above. It happened because you just got the right people in the right room. And yeah. one of the things that is certainly one of the optimisms I have is there is a desire to work with each other in, in the security industry, at least that I have seen and I have felt. And so a lot of times it's, you know, you might have uh, one chapter of SF, FSI SAC on, in one area that's less effective than in another. But if you get the right people together and you're just willing to share information, you're willing to work together, you're willing to just CISO to CISO, security analyst to security analyst, um, it is amazing the, how effective and how beneficial that kind of information sharing is. And you end up talking, say, hey, what works for you? Or have you heard about this problem? Or how have you solved this? Um, quite honestly, the best sharing and collaboration I've seen has been from grassroots up. And the formal, the ISACs, the InfraGuard, the, the, the other organizations are simply a mechanism of getting those grassroots people together. Um, yeah, we're just about out of time here, so um, maybe just to wrap it up, I don't know if there's maybe like a key takeaway you want people to remember from this or something that we didn't cover that uh, you'd like to, to mention quickly um, before we run out of time. Yeah, I mean, my final thought is uh, uh, to Harry's point, network, share, get involved for sure. Um, I, I get email still from prior colleagues or prior um, events that I've just by asking, right? sending emails saying, hey, how can I get involved? Is there anything going on in your particular environment? And people start recognizing your name, you get added to the distro list, and then you start uh, having a lot more uh, relationship building, which, which goes a long way, certainly. Uh, the other part is, is to make sure, is to ask yourself in your internal organization, what do you do well from a cybersecurity standpoint? You'd be, you know, I haven't met any organization that does, let's say, the top 20 controls well. To a certain extent, there's always a resource challenge. I, I is usually the issue. Um, but but what are you doing well, and what are you not doing well from the bread and butter stuff, right? And I usually use the top 20 as the bread and butter. Do you manage your assets effectively? Do you understand uh, what normal looks like in your environment? Meaning you you have a good idea. I won't say anybody's perfect. A good idea of what assets are doing what and what business process are they supporting and are you measuring the risk of those environments? That, that's just a kind of a requirement statement. If you're not doing those things well, you probably know where you're not doing them well if you're asking and probing. And you should see what can you do to raise the bar one notch at a minimum. Just measure in forward progress, pick the best framework that, that suits your needs, increase your resiliency, lower your risk threshold, make things happen that way, um, and you're, you'll be better off than you were yesterday. It, that's, that's good advice. I, I know that uh, in many cases maybe people are, are, are tuning in because they want to hear the magic answer or, hey, this is, this is going to be the solution to do well, and unfortunately it's not, and this is why I like um, things like the NIST cybersecurity framework. I like f having a framework because it allows you to to do that measurement and it allows you not just to do that measurement of what you do well and how you're doing against your goals but it also gives you a vehicle to communicate back so one of the challenges in security is you need support from your peers and from the networking but most importantly you need support from above you need budget you need authority you need awareness um, and having a framework gives you a tool to communicate um, upward it gives you a tool to communicate at an executive level um, and having networking in the industry gives you more information maybe it's you know in some cases scare tactics but it's actually very effective to say listen this is what's happening in the industry these are the types of attacks and we are subject to them and here's a framework and here's how we're going to prioritize look at where we're at risk we have no controls for this whatever this might be identity management, access controls, whatever the asset is you're trying to protect. Um, and it, being able to communicate that allows you then to get the resources, to get the support you need, to go ahead and make improvements. There's no question that there is, you know, we say this over and over, security is a process. So there's, it's never going to be a, a one and done, a set and forget. You're going to have to continue going at it. Um, but by having something that you can measure against and investing wisely in those directions, you're going to make progress every day. Um, and so, you know, I certainly would leave you with that thought. I would leave you with the, the thought that the challenges you're facing out there promise you that your peers in your, in your competitive and or sister organizations are facing the same ones. Um, and in some cases, you find that person or you find those people who have, have ideas, you come together, um, and as a whole, you'll definitely make progress. All right, well, thanks to Harry and Adam for joining us today. Um, 
Well, this this video is will be saved on YouTube, and we'll put an article up on hacksurfer.com tomorrow. But we'll put all those links uh, in the description on the event page if anyone wants to check them out in case they missed anything. Um, but yeah, thanks for joining us, guys. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right, thanks.